This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. I'm very, very grateful to be able to welcome you all to the uh, IHL, the Culture and Region Seminar. It's the second in our series this, this term. Um, I'm very, also very pleased to introduce uh, Kat, uh, Kat, Katrina. <laughs> I've always known you as Kat, which makes life that difficult, but it's, it's not. It's Kat Cooper. Um, just recently started with Allen Archaeology up at Lincoln. Um, I know Kat through her work, um, a collaborative doctoral award with, between the University of Southampton and National Trust, um, working on various sort of digital ways of looking at several National Trust properties in Kent. And is, what is Bowdoin, just in East Sussex? I don't know remember. Yeah, just about. Just about in East Sussex. Boundaries sort of the other side of Lane or something. Um, including Item Moat and uh, that most famous course there with Castle Studies, Bodian Castle. Now, we're not going to mention Charles Paulson tonight, but are, are we? We um, do. You feel like it. Um, so, got details of the Battle for Bodian ad nauseum in the press. Um, anyway, uh, so Kat today is going to sort of discuss some of her findings uh, in the project as a whole and a paper called Digital Approaches to Late Medieval Buildings in Southeastern England, in other words. It's not quite what we might expect. Mm. Hope you enjoy. Um, hi, as uh, Adam said, I'm Kat, um, and I've just finished. I say I've just finished my PhD. I've, I guess I finished my PhD nearly a year ago now. But I like to pretend that I'm still a student. <laughs> um, I just started working at Allen Archaeology doing heritage research, um, um, which kind of links in, I suppose, because I get to do a lot of digital stuff there. Um, I came to this project, which was a CDA award, um, which my supervisor, Matthew Johnson, applied for in collaboration with the National Trust in the South East. Um, and I was supervised by him and uh, Professor Graham Earls of Southampton, who's a digital um, humanities type kind of person. Um, and I, I was actually one of two students trying to sort of study this, um, this whole topic. The other student was a historian or an archival researcher and the idea was that we would try and like bring both of those sort of elements together to try and sort of think about late medieval buildings and how we can approach them in a kind of lived experience type of way and how we can kind of access more about that element of the building rather than maybe some of the more generic ways we've looked at them before. Uh, just to kind of centre you, um, I often give this presentation to Americans which is why we've got quite such like a clear idea about where we are but um, the project was originally going to include Scotney Castle as well as Bodium and Item but for various reasons like the, the state of the building which is significantly more degraded than uh, both Item and Bodium and also there's a distinct lack of archival research at Scotney meant we kind of ended up pushing that to one side as, as with any kind of PhD it all kind of gets a bit too much by year two you have no idea what you're doing um, so yeah that's where we are um, I kind of wanted to kind of approach this as sort of beginning to question how we use or how we've discussed spaces in buildings or how we've generally discussed medieval buildings in the past. Um, I, I mean, I focused on <coughs> item mode for a good kind of <coughs> half of the project. <coughs> um, it's okay, just to. Um, some water if you like. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I focused on item mode as a um, big sort of part of the project and it was um, and this is kind of a typical medieval manor house which is kind of grown out. By typical medieval manor house I mean it has the sort of standard layout of, um, a bit hard to see I'm afraid, of um, sort of great hall, services and kitchen to the lower end and then solars and a chapel to the higher end uh, entered via um, a courtyard. Uh, and these are just some of the different approaches people have taken to try and understand late medieval buildings. You know, we have the sort of fairly standard elevation <coughs> with plans, with plan drawings, or we have, um, this is access analysis. So we're looking at how you progress through the space. So you kind of enter through the gatehouse and you go into the great hall. And then the deeper into the building you get, then maybe it's more private or not. Uh, and this is planning analysis, which um, Faulkner into great use at Bodium Castle and kind of laying out the building in a kind of slightly different space to how we would think of it in plan and elevation view, which I know as an archaeologist that tends to be our approach on a lot of sites. I spent most of my last few days writing up a watching brief which had nothing in it. Uh, another approach, so this is the famous Bodium Castle. Everyone has tended to consider this building um, from the exterior. 
Uh, I, as part of the PhD, I was working um, as part of a wider project called the Elite, I think we call it Elite Landscapes in Southeastern England project, uh, which is run by Matthew Johnson. Uh, our monograph will be out next summer, we hope. Um, and we, through this project, we spent a lot of time recording the entirety of the building and also the surrounding area. So we did a whole series of geophysics grids in the area. And we also did a big landscape and topographic survey on top of the building survey. Um, Bodium specifically is often only discussed from its facades and people only really consider that, uh, as we all know from Battle of Bodium. Um, Bodium's caused uh, lots of questions um, by various people as to whether it's a military building or whether it's built of status. Um, I'm going to steer well clear of that argument. Um, as a, actually, one of the things that Bodium's not had a lot of work done on is the interiors. No one has really discussed it from the interior, other than maybe suggesting it is like a fairly typical medieval manor house as it displays the same kind of layouts as item mode. Um, kind of other way people have approached these buildings is also sort of to kind of discuss the owners. I had to shove a picture of a late medieval knight in for Adam, because, you know. Uh, this is uh, Sir Thomas Cohen, who um, built item mode, or developed item mode. Um, um, he's um, often discussed as um, a contemporary of Edward Dallingridge who built Bodium Castle. Um, we don't have an image of Edward Dallingridge, but instead I've got um, the heraldry, which kind of also links into the fact that a lot of people discuss the relationships these knights had and how they kind of related to the people rather than necessarily considering the buildings within their setting. Um, so my project was to focus on how we can use digital approaches to kind of begin to question not only the use of space, but sort of engage more with how people lived in and experienced these spaces. Uh, one of the big kind of projects, or one of the big areas of focus in archaeology anyway, is um, how we can use 3D modelling, or how we can visualise buildings and what this can kind of, how, how this can actually help us to understand the spaces. Um, so I, yeah, I started with uh, the idea of 3D modelling the space. Um, we recorded the building over I can't remember, it's three or four seasons of work at Bodium. Uh, two Easter seasons, and I can't remember if it's one or two summer seasons. It's, it's all been so long. Um, uh, we used a methodology of uh, creating a building survey using um, a total station linked up to a laptop using a program called TLT, which means we could visualise what we were recording as we were recording it, which is a good methodology in terms of uh, doing a building survey archaeologically because it means that you know what you've recorded and you can really check back on what you've got. So if you've missed a window, you notice you've missed the window kind of thing, which you, you laugh, but it's very easy <laughs> to do. Yeah. We realised we'd missed, so we, we uh, had to pull out someone else's designs and both of us had made mistakes in the elevation despite spending weeks and weeks of work on this place. Um, but yeah, so we, uh, we spent a long time and we created a whole series of traditional elevation drawings like this one, which was prepared by uh, Penny Co Copeland of uh, University of Southampton. Um, we also, we, we recorded the entire building in 3D. So this kind of little, this is all of our survey data to, to kind of look at. It kind of gives the, it, it helps to kind of bring together like what we actually recorded and how we can kind of, how this can help us visualise what's going on a bit. Because it kind of lets you take apart the building in a way that you can't necessarily do if you're actually there. It's, it kind of helps you break it down, which uh, is very useful if you're trying to discuss different elements. It's less useful if you're really trying to engage with how people in the past could have experienced the space because you're looking at it from a whole different perspective that isn't or wasn't necessarily possible during that period. Um, this is accurate to about one centimetre. Um, of the whole building and it just takes in a lot of the key elements. Um, if you're into digital approaches you might ask why we didn't laser scan it or why we didn't do use photogrammetry. Um, it's actually a lot easier if you've got the time to spend on site making your interpretation live while you're recording so making decisions about which elements to record whether that's towers and facades and everything rather than trying to do the same thing when you're back at a computer screen that's this big instead of having the whole place to look at. Um, and this told us a whole load of interesting things about how we interpreted Buildium Castle. So this is not displaying very well, which is really upsetting. Um, what this image is meant to show you is uh, running down here, we have a pig joint or a straight joint, 
Um, this is indicative of the change between two different seasons of work. It's where, because normally when you build, you definitely don't want like a line running straight up your building works. Sometimes these appear because of errors in building work where two pe teams have been working. Yeah, it's not showing very well at all. You'll just have to trust me, it's there. Um, uh, where two different teams of building men kind of came together at one point um, <coughs> without really realising and built up like that. Or it's usually more indicative of the case where people have just stopped at the end of one season and started again. The kind of position of these help us to kind of question where, which direction the building was built in to some extent, um, and also how many seasons of work had sort of undertaken in building this building. More interestingly, I think if you, you look at Bodium, and if you've read anything about Bodium, people always discuss, you know, it's beautifully symmetrical, <coughs> it's, you know, it's the perfect castle. Um, we actually have quite a lot of evidences of changes of mind in the construction, or little mistakes. So what we have here is a, um, oh, I can't remember what this is called, like a boss, um, which has just been stopped. And then we have a string course starting on the other side. This is the only place in the building where this happens. And actually, those two elements don't tend to happen in combination. So um, we really see here, and we think <coughs> this might be one of the first towers, or it was the first tower that might have been finished. Um, we really see here that something's happened, something's changed. Uh, one of the things about Bodium, if you're an architectural historian, it's considered one of the first uh, perpendicular domestic buildings. Um, so maybe this was just, we, we always kind of, when we talk about this, and we may have like, go into Edward Dallingridge's character. We've spent too much time with the um, interpreters at Bodium anyway. We always kind of suggest that maybe he's come back to his builds and changed his mind. He said, actually, no, I want this. This is all the rage over in France. Let's do this. So we've got, there's a whole series of like similar things like this going on where there's like slightly strange fireplaces in different areas and things like that. Um, and to some extent, there's other things which can tell us about both. So what you're looking at here is uh, there's a second gatehouse here on the back of the main gatehouse and it just doesn't quite fit together mainly because this here this is a spiral staircase and this here is also a spiral staircase so you've got two spiral staircases sitting back to back on top of each other um, where clearly someone's decided they needed a second gatehouse on the back of their first gatehouse for whatever reason and the two don't uh, well there's no evidence for them interlocking so you can't get from any space in this back gatehouse if you were entering the building from the front gatehouse so there's no kind of through fares um, which kind of begins us to question like actually this podium isn't necessarily the perfect castle it's constantly made out to be it's not necessarily it's not whether it's military or not even that it's just so this whole series of elements which don't quite fit together into kind of considering the grandeur of the building itself um, so I started thinking about how we could 3D model these spaces, what else I could find out from these things, what can I pull together to try and explore different elements of this building, like, independently. Um, so I took the survey data, uh, which gave me a, per like a representation of the size of the spaces and how we can use that, and I um, started to think about how I could uh, model the internal spaces. Specifically, I chose the private apartments because uh, they're... Um, they're quite a complex area. I realise I haven't put one of the slides I normally put in here. Um, the private apartments are two suites of buildings, uh, two suites of rooms, one on top of each other, and they look very, very similar when you look at them in elevation. Um, they have uh, the same windows in the same positions, they, they're backed onto the same wall. And when you look at them in elevation, people always say that they're the matching suites. There's you know, the, Lord's the Lord's suite and the Lady's suite, or you know, the stewards and the Lord's suite. Um, and actually, when you start to pull the thing, the evidence of these, like how to furnish and fit these rooms out, it actually becomes quite different. So I began by um, looking at similar spaces. So I'm sorry, these look really bad, or at least they do from here. This is going to be fun when I show you a beautiful 3D model with elegant lighting and it doesn't work. Uh, so we have um, Dover Castle here, which has been um, it, it was uh, reconstructed in the last I don't know 10 years maybe. Um, and it's actually one of the things I really like about this is um, you, you can see all of this coal or soot directly above the chimney, which shows it's been in use, which is something you don't tend to see on 3D modelled spaces. You don't tend to see the dirt or the muck that goes along with use of rooms. Um, 
And uh, one of the things a lot of people question about why bother with 3D modelling? Like, what, what does creating a 3D model give you um, that just having a survey data or uh, just reading about doesn't? And it's because you can combine a lot of these elements all into one kind of interpretation. So I can bring together ele evidence from the archaeological record. So I examined all the um, excavation work that had been done at Bodium, and I pulled out all the artefacts um, that had been found. So there's pottery sheds, which from, um, I can't remember, I think this is rieware. So I, I knew that, that those kind of pots were there. Um, and then that's the tiling. There was a <coughs> roof tile, so I knew that the rooms were tiled. Um, and I could look at these alongside um, a whole series of uh, like manuscripts which have sort of evidence more discreetly of bits of furniture and fittings and things like that. So, I mean, we always talk about um, the lateral salter. That's <coughs> a classic example everyone uses that a medieval hall would look a little bit like this. You've got a background with some heraldry on it and things like that. Uh, I can bring this together with um, furniture. I can bring this together with the actual archaeological survey and I can put all of these elements into one image, uh, which is not showing up at all on this screen, which is unfortunate, I'm afraid. Um, and the other thing you can do as well is um, you can begin to access more of how the space feels to some extent because you can do physically accurate lighting. So this lighting is from 6 o'clock in the afternoon. It's uh, as the sun is going down and the light's just coming through over here, through this window, which I've inserted into the hall. Um, I've combined this with, uh, to this back tapestry. This is, um, the pattern here is uh, from one of the coats of arms. So if I backtrack a few slides, here we go. So this coat of arms over here has the same pattern of birds situated on it. So that's, I made that decision. And in um, a couple of the other rooms I have different elements. I have um, a, a unicorn because that's Dallingridge's Tawny Hamlet and I've got uh, his specific coat of arms repeated over and over again. Um, what else? Uh, I've also taken um, a lot of influence from all the manuscript because when we think about medieval buildings, a lot of the time we think of really empty, cold, white spaces. We don't think of them as richly furnished or fitted out with like really rich, decadent textiles because we don't tend to see that as much. But I mean, that's one of the big things you pull out of reading. Um, uh, like wills and documents about that is you, and inventories. You, you hear a lot about the, 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 the textiles being passed on from like mother to daughter or father onto his children. Um, and so these were really, really considered very high class. And so those are very, very important. Um, it's a shame you can't see that. I've got a little jug here and you can see the light reflecting off it, which I was really ple pleased about when it came through. Um, but if you want to have a look at these later, I can show you them on my laptop where they're showing a lot better. Um, so, but one of the critiques about visualisation, um, at least in archaeology, is that you can create all these 3D models, but it's, it's representing my own personal interpretation of this space. Um, it's based on a whole series of decisions I have made about how this space should look. Um, and that's actually a little bit complicated. That's, that's me putting an interpretation onto the past that's not necessarily true. Um, I don't know, uh, recent, there was a, I read a Guardian um, article yesterday which was discussing how a, um, a historical fiction writer was put down because she creates a whole interpreted view of the past in comparison to historians on Radio 4. And um, there was a whole big discussion about the fact that historians definitely considered the two historians they interviewed, not all historians, that would be a horrible <laughs> thing to say, uh, these two historians definitely considered their work being far more important or far more valid than hers, despite the fact they're being very different audiences, which is very interesting. But I agree that actually this is very much my own interpretation. There are problems with this. There, is, there isn't really the evidence to support this model, or well, there is evidence, but I can't say that this is definitely how it looked. Um, so how can I kind of access this? And um, my suggestion was to, this one's looking a bit better actually, was to actually, because obviously I was funded by the National Trust to some extent through my CDA, I had to produce outputs that they could also use, that they would find interesting and useful for their own interpretation. So all my work had to feed back to them. So I, actually, I instead, I, I paired my, my 3D model, this is one of the, um, the <coughs> receiving room at the top end of the hall, um, alongside a lot of the source material around specific themes um, that are to do with living and kind of 
experiencing a space. So this one is to do with eating, and um, this is through the whole period. Uh, when you read about reconstructing medieval ruins, <coughs> you always uh, the quote that always comes up is Piers Plowman about uh, the lords no longer dine in their I can't remember the exact wording. Lords no longer dine in their halls. They uh, they go up to their own spaces and eat there and do not engage with their people or something. Um, so that's already showing that in the 14th century period that the lords are already not beginning to use their great halls, which I'll discuss in a lot more detail in my second case study. So I, yeah, so I, um, I've got this whole board on eating in these spaces, so I've got some of the pottery elements again, and <coughs> some uh, manuscript um, things of um, people eating and then um, other reconstructions and... Uh, some evidence about the furniture as well, so uh, we've got the chair from Westminster, yeah. Um, and then again, I've got the same one, this one's to do with sound. So, um, as I'm going to continue more to talk about, the past isn't just, we don't just see the past, we don't just look at the past, as Adam said um, when I started this. Um, we have to try and understand the whole of the experience of the past, which is multi-sensory. Um, and I kind of wanted to look at images which kind of started making mar- elicit some emotions about what we hear and how we how we engage with those kind of elements. So um, I brought some more music musical elements, and I kind of thought about this more as an acoustical sense. Um, with all the fabric in a room, that's going to make a very kind of muffled space. It's going to be very different to talking in this room, for example. <coughs> you can already hear my voice slightly echoing off probably the ceiling in this room. Um, and elements like that, so um, that was another of the boards. Um, and then I, just to kind of validate myself a little bit, I um, I threw these in because I didn't know how long I had to talk for. Um, I may, I, as part of my thesis, I wanted to deal with the fact that I actually wanted to critique my own visualisation. I didn't want to just produce these visualisations to say, look, I was amazing. So I um, gave out a whole series of questionnaires to people and I asked them. And, um, whether they thought visualisations could help them think about medieval life, specifically at Bodium Castle. And uh, generally the outlook was positive. And I've got a quote down here, which is very hard to read. Uh, they help to understand how spaces are constructed and used, um, and the feel of the room, the colour degree, the colour, the degree of privacy, warmth, sound and smells. So that was kind of like my kind of assessment that maybe that they can really help. Um, there's a whole series of things I'd love to do with this in the future. Um, and then I asked if the visualisation worked on their own, best on their own, or they were much better um, put in the perspective with all the um, other images around the edge, so all of the um, supporting material, or the secondary sources and things. Um, and again, that was uh, generally positive. People tended to like having the physical things that were lent, went into the model alongside the renderings, which was good. Uh, so I, I already mentioned the fact that I wanted to engage more with sound um, in archaeology um, and in history actually so Chris Walgar's written a fantastic book which I have used an awful lot in my thesis about how, how we can engage with the um, senses in the past here um, I always throw the slide in because there's a whole series of kind of people who who kind of, kind of acknowledge the fact that we don't engage with the senses and maybe why we don't engage with the senses more widely. So whether it's because they're intangible or there's no real direct evidence, a lot of representations and things that they lack the authenticity. Um, generally, they tend to privilege the visual over the other senses. Um, more interestingly, I think, is when people say the vision is objective, which is very complicated. Um, and yeah, so it, there's a whole, there's, people have been engaging with this, but they haven't necessarily gone very far with how they can engage with it more, I hate to use the word scientifically, but how that they can, how, how just generally how one can engage with the past. I mean, Chris Walgar's book is fantastic. He really deals with it through a whole series of archival evidence, um, which is really nice to bring together with them, what I'm going to talk about. So I moved on from visualisation at Bodium, and I looked at how to create oralisations at item mode. Oralizations are quite easy to get. They are, um, how do I explain? They're like creating um, reconstructions of the sound as opposed to, I hate using the word reconstruct, that's very naughty of me. But I'm thinking about other things. Um, but how we, how we can like model sound in the past. 
So um, I went to Fight to Promote and I looked at three different spaces, but I went with a team from the Institute of Sound and Vibration Studies at Southampton and uh, they really liked the Great Hall, so we ended up working on the Great Hall. <laughs> uh, we also recorded the acoustics for the Solar, which would have been a much better comparison to the visualisation project. But um, acoustical modelling is, is not at the same place as visual modelling is. It's not, it's not as sophisticated yet and it's not so finely tuned as um, I'll probably discuss in a minute. So um, it doesn't work very well in small spaces because um, it's a lot harder to model where the waves go. So um, we, we looked at this, um, the Great Hall item. Um, you look at this building, and, oh, you look at this space specifically, and um, there's actually been quite a few changes to the interior. So I could go and record the acoustics here, but it wouldn't be the same as in the past. For example, the wooden panelling throughout this space is a Victorian insertion. This perpendicular window was introduced, I think, in like the late 14th century, but the hall itself is actually an early 14th century space. Um, and there are a whole series of elements like that. Um, to record, we, um, we recorded the acoustics in the hall, and I used the same methodology really as I used in the visualisation. I, um, I took the recording, and then I modelled the space to match the recording. So I included all of the um, wooden panelling and everything. And once those two sounds are very, very similar, I started to basically un pull, pull the model apart and reintroduce other elements. So when you're creating a visualisation, I start with a ruined building, and then I have to rebuild up the walls and then create all the interiors. This is, to some extent, in reverse, because I have to take things away from the model to get the right space, but it's the same kind of thing. Um, uh, to record the acoustical properties of space, we send um, a sine sweep sound, which is just, um, it covers all of the frequencies, so from low frequency to very high frequencies, so you can discuss men's voices versus female voices within the space. Um, that excites the hall, and then the receiver records the response to that and sends it back through the laptop. Uh, this signal you can then use to... Um, to morph a, a, blank, a, a, a sound recorded in a blank <coughs> space. Uh, so this is us recording in the space. This is, we went to Itemoto and we um, were in there overnight so that the, we weren't getting um, any background noise from people around or anything like that. Um, and because it's in the middle of nowhere, you don't have to worry so much about traffic. Um, these are three different microphones. This is a binaural microphone, which means it catches directionality, so left ear, right ear. Um, it's very hard to explain to people who are deaf in one ear. This is an omnidirectional microphone, which means it was um, it was recording from both sides, which could be very interesting to discuss in terms of how you stand when you are presenting or what you hear from different places in the hall. And then that's just a normal microphone to act as a tester. Uh, so we, like I said, I did the modelling um, and I created a 3D model of the space. Uh, you'll notice it's nowhere near as pretty as the other one. Um, as I said, acoustical modelling is not quite so sophisticated, and you have to, in fact, rec um, you have to model it in planes. You can't create curves very easily at all. Each of these has to be um, coded out uh, using um, like X, Y, Zs. So it's not quite as easy to produce. Um, this is the Great Hall as it stands today. I then modelled the Great Hall as it stood in the past and compared the results. Uh, we had to, to, to create an oralisation, you have to have a sound recorded in a dead space. So this is an anechoic chamber, which means it doesn't have any reverberation. The, the space itself, is, it doesn't respond. It's a very weird place to be in. So right now you're hearing my voice echoing off the sides of the walls because there's no, um, there's no soft furnishings. So it's like comparing you, when you have a conversation in a sitting room, which is quite muffled, or it's why people always say you should see me in the bathroom because everyone sounds fantastic in the bathroom. It's because sound reflects off all the room, all the walls and all the ceilings and things. Um, you don't want that in a recording, so you record in a dead space so it doesn't react. And then you can convolve, so you can mix your voice into the signal you recorded in the building and you create the oralisation so it sounds like you were in the building. And this is why it's quite interesting to try and engage with sound in the past. My throat is also dying, so I'll let you listen to my voice in a different way. So here are my results. I've got two here. 
so I've got to tweak this a bit. There we go. So this is the recording of the Great Hall we did. <laughs> no, it isn't. Oh. 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 There we go. Oh. Don't know if I can do this with both of my hands. Can I borrow your finger? You might. Yeah. Can you put it down there? You might have to like gently tweak it. This is the Great Hall of Axmo in Seven Oaks in Kent. It's one of the oldest areas of the development, dating from the early 14th century. Okay, is that the, the recording? Um, so I didn't I didn't say that in the hall, I said that in the Anaco chamber, then we convolved it with the signal we recorded in the hall. And this is the, the modelled version of the 14th century Great Hall. This is the Great Hall of Axmo in Seven Oaks in Kent. It is one of the oldest areas of the building, dating from the early 14th century. Go back to the first one, so hopefully you can hear the slight difference. This is the Great Hall of Itemo in Seven Oaks in Kent. It is one of the oldest areas of the building, dating from the early 14th century. So hopefully, thank you very much, madam. Very well done. <laughs> uh, hopefully, you would have heard that the the, the first one um, it was a lot more reverberant. It was a lot more echoey um, because I didn't. So I removed all that wooden panelling which was just replaced with um, the same kind of um, um, rendered, yeah, there we go, plaster walls. I never guess I was a buildings archaeologist. Um, and, and, it, and also I introduced a whole series of tapestries and wall hanging. Well, wall hangings, not tapestries, because tapestries are a bit later. Um, there are a number of sort of values on top of just generally listening to the results. There's a whole series of values that you can use to discuss this. Uh, so early decay time is the very short, like, first response you hear. Um, so I just kind of use this slide here because you can see this kind of <coughs> graph. And it's interesting because this is frequency which relates to pitch of voice. So lower frequencies is more man's voices, higher frequency is women's voices. And it was quite interesting that it's fairly consistent across the board there. Um, and then I also did the reverberation time. Um, the difference between the measured versus the simulated also is to do with how we model it. And it's just showing that we actually managed to get the model fairly close on to the... Um, so I said that I... Sorry, I'll go back and clarify that point. So when I um, produced the model, first we did a recording in the space. Uh, and then I modelled that space to match the recording. And then I altered the model to work as um, a 14th century hall. So I took apart all the elements from the, the calibrated model, which had been calibrated against the recording. So it's very, usually I explain it much more clearly, and I'm not doing a very good job, I'm afraid. Um, but the, yeah, it's just to kind of show that we actually managed to line up the measured and predicted data very, very closely. Um, and then I, I made people listen to it um, and tell me whether they thought it sounded same or different um, based on a man or woman's voice and um, I think generally it was fairly kind of consistent across the two really. Um, reverberation is actually an interesting number because um, it kind of collaborate. Uh, people have um, analysed spaces using reverberation um, so I'm just going to skip over this and go straight on to the reverberation time. So reverberation time is a, is a numerical value used by acousticians to kind of discuss how a space is best suited or what the space is best suited for. And this is one of the reasons <coughs> I created this model. It wasn't just to kind of try and help people listen to the past. It's also the fact that we can use this to kind of discuss how, how well suited a space is for different elements. So great halls are quite interesting or quite challenging because... Um, They've been interpreted in a whole different ways. Um, one of my favourite interpretations is, or to discuss is the, you can look at the pop culture references of a game of Thrones Great Hall, which is all about drunken revelry and excitement. Or you can discuss the Lord of the Rings Great Hall, which is all about high elves and pe poetry being read into very silent spaces or quiet spaces. And those are two very different interpretations of a very similar kind of idea. It's, it's two elements of Great Halls that we, we've kind of come to believe, but how do we decide which is more relevant? Uh, I spoke to Chris Walgar a lot, and he's always like advocating a very silent great hall, a very formal space. But actually, uh, the great the um, the reverberation time, so this wouldn't necessarily be very helpful. 
a one second reverberation time is actually quite long. It, it kind of drums up a lot of like excess noise. It's not very good for music because the, the sound doesn't last long enough. So a 1.6 second reverberation time is very good for organ music. 1.4 is very good for classical music because classical music you want the notes to be cut off. You don't want them to all run together into one go. Uh, to put this in perspective, York Minster has a seven second reverberation time. Uh, to do public speaking, a one second reverberation time is actually pretty good, um, which is why apparently in York they do not have uh, graduations in York Minster because um, it makes it impossible for the staff to give speeches. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so um, it kind of began, at least it helps us at item mode kind of discuss the use of space a little bit more. Um, we can kind of begin to question whether the formal, formal readings um, and kind of very, very silent spaces are actually possible, um, as opposed to sort of the more, rev more, more reverie or more like active and private conversations versus public conversations are possible. Um, to be honest, it all links back into the idea that maybe the Great Hall is a much more peripatetic space and it has a whole different range of uses and it's not necessarily particularly suited to one element or another. But I, I would argue that I definitely don't think it's, it's a helpful silent space. I think there's a whole different series of elements which I'd like to explore more, like how well sound travels throughout a building and whether, um, whether things like the kitchen sounds would come through or not, sort of things like that, which... Uh, there's a whole different like kind of background research to do for that um, towards the lived experience. However, me doing these recordings and these oralizations is actually me doing an oralization. I, I critiqued my visualizations for being ocular centric, so only focusing on what we can see. But actually, um, my oralizations do the same thing because they're only focusing on what we can hear. And actually, our experience is a whole like range of these things pulled together. It's actually needs to be considered. So I also run this, the same listening tests with um, binding a visual element, so letting people see what they were listening to and removing that or taking it away. And it was really interesting how how much it affected the responses I had, considering it was broadly the same group of people listening to it. And a lot of people said that they, they found the visuals very much confused what they were hearing, um, or they really didn't want to be looking at things because they found it very, very confusing for what they were doing. Um, which I think highlights even more the fact that studying these two things independently is actually very, very difficult. You can't really do that. We need to be kind of moving towards somewhere where we can kind of we can begin to put both of these things together and start thinking about not just what we see in the past or how we engage with what's visual, but also what what, what we can hear and what we can smell and just all of the senses in one go. So obviously the next steps have to be a um, oh. Completely lost the word for it. Yeah, virtual. Well, we can't use virtual oh, reality. No. Paul wouldn't like it. Um, an Oculus Rift kind of approach, which um, it's very. If you've ever experienced one, I definitely recommend you do. It's very strange. You put on headphones and things, and you can't see or hear what's going on around you. You can only see what's projected into you. Um, but it's very interesting for exploring different spaces. So I've kind of used one of these where they were. They'd done a whole series of oralizations of um, uh, a musicians' hall or a theatre, and you get to sit in different spaces and kind of move around and listen to the music moving around. And it's very strange, but it's it's possibly the next step to go if we want to kind of access different elements of medieval life. Thank you, Rich. I hope that wasn't too <laughs> off the cuff. I'm a bit, yeah. <laughs> Thank you.